about the future of creativity, sometimes we need only look to the past to draw inspiration. Past innovations can continue to inform and inspire whole new generations of artists, thinkers, and doers. And such is the story of the modular synthesizer. Well, what exactly is a modular synthesizer? Well, you watched us set these things up, and you, well, it looks like we're about to launch something outside. I promise you this is only for music-making purposes. Housed in these cases, sharing a common power, are a series of individual modules. Now, these modules are electronic music instruments designed with specific purposes in mind. For example, some can output random voltages, while still others can output tuned voltages, like those to our equal-tempered scale. Still others can do real-world sampling, so recording sounds in and using control voltages to manipulate the playback. Now, how do they communicate? With this intricate nest series of beautiful, colorful, wonderful patch cables, which trust me, as the father of a toddler, three-year-olds love blinky lights and patch cables. But you know who doesn't like blinky lights and patch cables? Ask Bobby. TSA. TSA, yeah. TSA does not like it. really don't like it. <laughs> So now, going on to uh, talk about some more popular synthesizers of the 60s and 70s. The Moog synthesizers were primarily dominant in this time. They were very expensive, bulky, um, primarily used waveform filters and uh, incredible control over their sound using said filters. And the most important, in my uh, opinion, aspect of it is the keyboard, which allowed everyday musicians to integrate into the modular system. Now moving over to the West Coast and the Buchla systems. The Buchla systems were different in both design and mindset. They wanted to create sounds that we had never heard before and at the time couldn't really conceive. We just had to do it and then they would happen. Uh, another big feature of the Buchla systems were wave shaping and the use of a touch control which is still active in our systems today. Now Morton Sabotnik was a composer and co-founder of the San Francisco Tape Music Center. And that institution commissioned Donald Buchla to create a new electronic music instrument, one that did not have a keyboard manual, but simply knobs and buttons that could then sculpt sound in real time. Sabotnik created in 1967 his composition Silver Apples of the Moon, and it was recorded using the Buchla 100 system at Sabotnik Studio at New York University. If I might speak personally for a moment, this album, a landmark in electronic music making, still remains as fresh, innovative, experimental, as cool as it must have sounded to a listener back in 1967. And so here, with thanks to Morton Sabotnik, is a little clip from Silver Apples of the Moon. Now you would think, with all this momentum, Moog synthesizers, Buchla synthesizers being installed in universities and studios throughout the country and throughout the world, that the modular synthesizer would stay at the forefront of electronic music making. But that was not the case. It was interrupted by the digital revolution. As we have mainstreamed our data into digital format, and computers suddenly became more popular at work and in the house, and then became more portable, more personal, more powerful, electronic music composers started to use those for their music making. And thus we saw the rise of the home studio. Now with not a lot of money, a computer, some studio monitors, maybe a keyboard control surface, it was possible to make really professional sounding, really authentic electronic music in the comfort of your own home. But not everybody was on digital, and some were still interested in the possibilities of analog technology. Yes, yeah, so if there was anyone who had an eye for the future of creativity, it would be Dieter Dofer. Dieter Dofer was a physics student in the 1970s who messed around with electronic instruments and analog uh, synthesizers. And in 1995, this kind of era where we consider the resurgence of the modular synthesizer to begin, he created what we now know as the A100 system. This system form, uh, created a format which we now consider the uh, Eurorack format. 
This format consists of a uniform size for the width of panels that we call hit points, a uniform size for the height of panels, three audio units, and other things that uh, like power distribution, power uh, connections, and the nifty use of a three and a half millimeter jack, which we commonly use as a headphone jack today. Now, thanks to Doper's work in the Eurorack format, we are now living in really an industry boom for Eurorack. According to Modular Grid, which trust me, if anybody out there is a modular synthesizer person, they've been on Modular Grid for far too much time. There are over 300 manufacturers currently making Eurorack modules. Each one of these companies has their own unique approach to the genre, and their look, feel, and style can be integrated into any person's system based on their own customization or tastes. There are now stores that sell Eurorack modules, such as Control in Brooklyn, New York, where a user can go in and rather than relying on the internet, test out a module, integrate it into your own system, see if it works for you, and then hopefully walk home with it. Now, at this point, we couldn't give you an exhaustive listening list, but we can give you a starting point. So after you go and Google Silver Apples on the Moon and check that out and listen to it, here are a few more artists that we might recommend you fall down the rabbit hole of modular listening. Uh, the first is going to be Caitlin Aurelius Smith. She's a composer and a musician working in California who uses modular synthesizers in her music. Her most recent album, Tides, Music for Meditation and Yoga, was commissioned by her mother to be played at her uh, yoga classes she was teaching. Its ambient soundtrack, soundtrack is beautiful with endlessly you know, unfolding waves of sound and melodies and textures, and it was composed using the Buchla Music Easel, designed by the same Buchla of the Buchla 100 and Silver Apples of the Moon. Next, we move on to Richard Devine. Richard Devine is an electronic musician, primarily using modular synthesizers. Uh, his music focuses mostly on glitch and heavily processed sound. His most recent album is Sort Slash Lave, and he's been active since 1995. Again, the kind of beginning of the renaissance of what we now see today. And lastly, Ross Fish. Ross Fish is the founder of Moffinzief Modular, a company that specializes in drum modules that are gritty and kind of glitchy and big and loud and bombastic, and I really like his approach to the style. In fact, we're going to spend a little bit of time showcasing some of uh, Ross's modules in Moffinzief because we're going to get to the best part about this presentation, some live music. So, what we have in front of us here uh, are the modulars uh, that we have our own custom systems for. And so, Bobby, if you're going to start this off, Yes, of course. So to begin this off, uh, uh, Jared and I are sharing what we call a clock signal, which you can see is connected by these two cables. They're going from both of our make noise systems, our uh, tempies, and connecting it together. It's basically our metronome, so we stay, all of our connections stay in time. To start it off, to start off with this simple sound, which is the basis for all the tempos and uh, clock generation you're about to hear. Jared, would you like to explain your system? So Bobby's uh, sending a clock into me, and I'm going to bring in a sound that kind of matches that a little bit. You can see I'm taking that clock signal and multiplying it a little bit, so I'm getting like a 16th note feel on top of what he has. So my clock is going into the Moffinzief Mito, which is a six-channel clock divider. I can take this sound from the Moffinzief dial-up, open it up a little bit so you can hear it, and change those divisions so that we get kind of like a really cool polyrhythmic feel. If I'm working backwards in my Moffinzief system, I now have this squeaky, lovely, beautiful cricket sound. More polyrhythms, I love this. And then going <laughs> further back, a uh, really grungy wavetable module called the Muskrat. And then even farther, the Moffinzief GMO, genetically modified oscillator, which allows you to import your own samples onto it. And I've got some drum sounds on there right now. Kind of a woody snare drum almost that I can change the, the pitch uh, speed playback of. Kind of like that. Back to just Bobby. Yes, so I like to incorporate some uh, bass sounds that I have coming on here uh, from my Make Noise STO. And it's being sent signal from my Make Noise Renee, which is sending it a control voltage, basically telling it what notes or frequencies to play. More sound I have coming on here is just another complementary sound to that bass, which is an alternating oscillator as well. And they're being alternated by these three channels in my tempo. You can see flashing here, which are being randomly modulated around. So they're switching tempos. The tempo never really stays at one specific uh, uh, ratio. 
Some more sounds I like to include are just some more glitchy sounds that are courtesy of the feedback of my Echophone coming through my Phonogene, which is uh, both make noise products. One is a sampler and one is an, an echo module. So you can hear just that added grittiness to the sound. And the last sounds I have are courtesy of my touch control panel right here. Which allow me to just add a little bit more free improvisation in the moment of our performance. So Jared, would you like to join back I in? I would love to join.